Good afternoon, everyone. I think everyone should be back in the room. If you're not, you're missing out. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon and for being here for this uh, final discussion, discussion session for the day. Um, we're here to discuss the role of new technologies and the next generation of renewables. Um, it's really my honor to be on a truly, uh, be sitting on a truly impressive panel. Um, we have representatives from some of the largest energy holdings in, and not just in Turkey, but also in the region. And then also we'll get some interesting perspectives from the manufacturing side and also direct uh, reports from the startup scene. Um, I also want to remind everyone that this session will be on the record. Uh, if you'd like to engage with the discussion or follow it on Twitter, the details should be on the screen, um, handles and hashtags. So today we've heard in, in basically every session the importance of innovation and new technology. The Deputy Minister outlined this morning R&D, innovation and startups as key drivers and supporters of the energy transition. So this panel is really going to be a chance for us to dive deep into those conversations. I will leave some time at the end for questions, so if there's anything that you'd like to ask our panelists, please do uh, make a note of that and we'll come to them at the end. So to kick things off, um, I'd like to start on my, on my left, Mr. Yücekal. As, as the CEO of one of Turkey's uh, largest energy groups and also with activities, uh, broader activities in I think something like 20-something 20, 20 countries, 20 countries yes. I wonder if you could just give us a picture of what you see as the main drivers um, behind both technological innovation in general and also the adoption of new business models in the energy sector. Sure. Is this on, by the way? Is it, oh, yeah, it's on. Um, I'd like to start by saying thank you for Atlantic Council and EBRD for inviting me to, inviting me to this panel. Um, Obviously, it's a very, uh, very large question, and I'll, I'll do my best to answer as much as I can. Um, it's been over 140 years that we've been using electricity in our lives at the end of the day. And I think the electricity market is facing the most dramatic change in its time today. I mean, in this time around, the change is not driven by uh, government legislation or policy, but it's driven by technology and demand. I just want to talk about a little bit of the overall mega trends that we see in the electricity sector. The electricity consumption is expected to increase 100% in the next 30 years. As a, and it will be driven by electrification of the key end uses, especially in road transportation, in buildings, and continued urbanization in the world. So that is one big mega trend that will drive increased demand. The other one, I mean, we talked in the morning in all these panels and almost all this additional generation capacity will be, will be met by renewables, and mainly solar and wind. I mean, so this is a clear, clear breaking trend from the overall fossil fuel generation trend we had so far in the world. In the next five years, uh, the new build, renewable generation that uh, will outcompete the cost of the fossil fuel generation plants in most countries. As a consequence, half of the generation capacity in the next 15 years will be coming from renewables. And once the generation capacity is over 30% coming from renewables in your grid, then it puts a lot of pressure in, uh, on your grid to be able to maintain it and to be able to manage it. This added renewable capacity will need balancing on the grid as it increases share in the total, as I said. So the generation uh, from gas will remain to act as a stable base on the load provider side and for balancing, and we'll see a lot more battery storage applications uh, and smart grid applications to be able to shave into the peak demand. While this is happening, um, we are moving away from centralized power plants, so entering into an overall, overall distributed grid and peer-to-peer uh, peer -peer market trading and all that. So we used to have producers and consumers in the past. Now we're going to have something called prosumers, somebody who's able to produce and consume electricity at the same time, and which will require a totally new operating model. And with this liberalization of the two grid technologies that become really crucial as smart grids, an increased number of smart meters that we uh, have to adapt, 
and overall battery storage applications in the grid uh, will be crucial for our industry. I'm sure everybody in this room, um, and we are working on some sort of applications in either one of these, uh, of these technologies um, to be staying competitive in our industry. Uh, in generation companies, grid operators are experimenting with battery storage today uh, just to be able to ready to deploy them when the battery application technologies are financially feasible everywhere in the else in the world. And it will happen in the next three to five years. I mean, we'll see battery storage applications becoming financially uh, feasible and viable without any requiring any subsidies or incentives in the next five years for sure. I mean, when you talk about when you talk about smart grids, we have more than 800 million smart meters operational today in the world, um, almost half of which is in China. And as the number of smart meters increases, there is a lot more data that we're able to collect. And with that, um, our predictions are more precise. We can optimize the supply and the overall demand side, and we can, we can make money from this trade. Um, at the end of the day, these are the drivers from my point of view, for technological innovation. I mean, increased ex electricity demand, renewable-based generation, distributed smart grid, advancements on the overall battery storage, and peer-to-peer -peer trading with smart grid. Now, on, the, on the second part of your question, uh, Catherine, you asked, what will be the driver for the application and ad adaptation of these technologies? I think, from my point of view, I see two big drivers. One of them is sustainability. Um, there is a clear push from corporations, individuals, uh, to decrease their carbon footprint. Um, as an example, there is an organization called RE100. Um, these are the global corporate leadership initiative, bringing together influential businesses together that are committed to 100% renewable energy. And in this list, we have uh, today 224 companies. And as these, country, uh, as these companies are operating in our region, they will ask us to provide renewable energy to them. And at the individual, individual level, um, we have the Greta effect. I mean, it's gaining momentum. There is a lot more push from individuals to be able to use renewable energy at their homes, at their applications. And uh, I mean, in our country, we're working on a draft which enables the option for customers to use only and only renewable energy if they act. Um, and the other one, other than sustainability, is just uh, financial feasibility. I mean, we talked about quite a bit about renewable costs coming down in the morning today. Uh, battery storage costs getting lower and lower every day. So we believe these new innovations, new technologies, applications will create their own economic value and economic model and become quickly financially feasible. So that will be the main driver for their adaptation in the markets. Thank you. That was a, a very useful uh, outline of, I think, the main kind of macro level trends that we're seeing pushing innovation in the energy sector. I'd like now um, to turn to Ms. Pekin Uzab. Um, tell us a little bit about your exposure to innovation in the energy sector. I mean, you have one of the largest renewables portfolios uh, in Turkey and the broader region. What is the visibility? What, what's your outlook on the startup scene? And how do you adopt what you're seeing in that sector into your business? Thank you, Catherine. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Pelin Akınazar, representing FM Renewable Energy. Um, it's a company with partners of EBRD and IFC of installed capacity of 700 megawatts at the moment. Um, of them, 50% is wind, 35% is hydros, and the remaining 15% is solar. We are aiming to hit 1,000 megawatts hopefully soon, and then I view the company. When we talk about digitalization in the sector, it is quite exciting times indeed. I want to touch base upon the term cyber physical systems, which is a composition of both physical elements such as hardware and software algorithms that control and monitor while interacting with human beings. Why have I began with this term? Because for many energy sector players, hardware is actually um, what digitalization equals to many of us is more about hardware than software. There are indeed significant developments in the main elements of the energy sector, say production, distribution, wholesale, or trade, which are driven by sensor-based autonomous systems, but the big catch is in the hardware area. When we talk about hardware, um, there had been a mention of smart meters, smart grid infrastructure, electrical vehicle charging stations, 
and so far they have attracted 50 billion dollars um, of investment. And Bloomberg, actually, New Energy Finance, expects that number to reach 64 uh, billion dollars by 2025. So this is definitely an area um, that is um, up for growth. And then I'll talk about the second bit in your second question. Sure, thank you. So this morning we heard about Transition 1.0, and Zorlu has really been one of the big companies in Turkey, along with the others that are represented here, that have been among the first movers in that space. But you've also started to move into that transition 2.0 with adopting a variety of different smart solutions. Would you tell us a little bit about what those options are and what you've learned as one of the first movers in that space in Turkey? Uh, actually... Hi, thank you for uh, inviting me for this uh, event. You know. Although it's the last one, you know, still we have uh, plenty of people here. Uh, so, about uh, you know, we have to look at the, look at ten years later. You know, it's, uh, it's everything is going to change and evolve, and what we are doing today will not be part of our lives. So, uh, this is uh, this is how we started our uh, investment in the. Uh, you know, distribution company. You know, it's, it's, it was a very important move for us. You know, we have a company called Vestel where it produces, you know, uh, refrigerators, white goods, brown goods, and also uh, televisions. It's an uh, electronic company, but now it's moving into the uh, car industry together with Tok, and also, uh, you know, a part of the uh, deal is to produce electric and with renewable energy and also reach uh, charging stations and smart grid operations. Uh, so it's, it's fully a diversified business from our uh, point of view. So uh, actually I look at Vestal and Zorla Energy uh, a single company today. You know, it's, they are not separate. They are uh, acting like a single company. One of them produces, uh, you know, hardware. The other one produces electric and and uh, they bring their power together in the distribution company where they can bring smart solutions to the uh, you know customers so but are we there yet no we have to work hard you know because uh, it's not easy to bring two uh, big companies together and and also a distribution company to act together so uh, we, we need some time to achieve that goal but we started the process. Right now, Vesta started to produce uh, charging stations and also working over the uh, smart uh, uh, you know, software systems together with Microsoft. And we are using those uh, systems in our car charging uh, network and also we, we will try to uh, adapt it to our distribution company because when when you look at our distribution company, it's just in the middle of Turkey, you know, not middle but in the middle of let's say uh, east part of Turkey, uh, west side of Turkey, you know, uh, it's in Osmania, uh, uh, it's like Osman Gazi distribution company called, you know, where Eskişehir, Kütahya, Afyon, Uşak, and Bilecik. It's the cross section of uh, all the highways, uh, I can say, so, uh, and also it's in the middle of the, the high grid voltage lines, so everything has to be smarter in our area. Why? Because the uh, major part of the renewables that uh, from solar is in our location. We need to, uh, you know, uh, we need to make the grid smarter in the following at least five years, so that, uh, you know, uh, the upcoming uh, projects will have uh, room to grow over there. Plus, uh, you know, we, we talk about storage, we talk about, uh, you know, blockchain technologies, maybe you will talk about it in the, uh, in the coming uh, session. But, uh, you know, everything has to get smarter over there. The gas stations will become electric stations and the cars will become the storage of the grid. Uh, not more than, you know, seven to ten years, I can say. Uh, I look at, you know, right now when, we, when I go to the uh, Istanbul airport, I see the large, uh, you know, parking lot. And, but what I, what I see actually over there is a uh, large storage area for electric. 
uh, most probably you know, every, di every day uh, th there will sit like 5,000 to 10,000 cars over there and look at the storage size that we have and every car is a customer, will become a customer in our uh, grid and we have to talk with them. We have to, uh, you know, uh, find a way to buy an electric from the, uh, from the cars uh, and also support the grid uh, with those, uh, you know, uh, smart systems. Uh, we all say that, you know, we need to support the renewables with uh, storage and it will come and all that stuff, but, uh, uh, you know, the cars will be the uh, initial storage uh, location because uh, the total production of batteries in the world is around 300,000 megawatt today and it will go up to a couple of millions, but they are not enough for uh, storage, uh, I mean, they are just enough for the cars to be produced, not for the, uh, you know, grid to support, uh, but, uh, or for the renewables. It will take uh, uh, at least 10 years uh, for, the, uh, for the renewables to be uh, base load, uh, uh, as far as I see. So, we can talk about maybe about the blockchain technologies in the next round. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Al Monif, as a manufacturer, innovation, of course, will look different for GE Renewables. Could I ask you, basically, how do you identify and, and quantify the opportunities and risks of developing new technologies? And how do you balance the improvements in the value chain that allow you to reduce costs with still developing a robust R&D sector and bringing out new products at the same time? First of all, uh, thank you so much, Karen, for the invite, and uh, thank you for the Atlantic Council. Uh, I am uh, Manara al Munif. I lead uh, renewable energy for General Electric in the MENAT region. Innovation is, is the heart of this industry. Innovation is in our DNA, and it's the main driver to make this industry strive and develop. Uh, as my colleague owner have mentioned, the demand for electricity is increasing year over year. Equally, the pressure and cost is coming down year over year, and you need to make sure that you invest in new technologies that's going to be able to deliver according to the expectation and reduce the cost significantly, as well reduce the carbon dioxide emission rate. You know, we strive every year to introduce new technology. When you look at the renewable industry as an example 10 years ago, and you just think of what was available at that time versus what we see there, the speed of innovation and new technology that came to this industry is remarkable. It is one of the highest that you see around the world. It drove the price significantly down. And the optionalities that you have today, so my colleague was speaking about baseload green electrons, and I think so this is coming very soon. A few years ago, you will never even, even speaking about the idea of baseload. A few years, all of the countries around the region was challenging the fact it doesn't make economic sense for us to go toward renewable because it was too expensive. Now renewable is by far much more cheaper than conventional and across the board. And that applies not only for oil exporting country but also for oil importing countries. The technology is proven and actually the cost is down and everyone now is moving on the pace to actually how can we deploy faster and more renewable. And if we look at the different innovations and where we need to really focus, I think so my colleagues have alluded. Today, mixing energy and focusing on how can we sell baseload green electrons. And here you're focusing and combining multiple sources of energy, looking at, example, wind, looking at solar, as well as storage. That's where the future is coming, and that's where we're going to see a lot of more development, specifically in that area. And we're, as example, as a manufacturer, it's our job to partner with the customer and innovate new solutions, not only focusing on the global needs, but how can we customize them for our customers in the current region they have. As an example, uh, no one globally would think of putting wind turbine in the desert because it doesn't make sense. No one would do it. But today, a lot of the countries in the Gulf are looking to implement wind turbine and they have to have an efficient wind turbine that works for them. So we invested and innovated a new technology, which is a desert package, to make these turbines function as optimal as they would function anywhere else around the world. We've looked at how can we reduce the cost. 
Part of reducing the cost is introducing bigger turbines that are more efficient, that will be able to reduce the cost of energy and meet the demand of the region. So, you know, in that industry, innovation have to continually develop, and we balance it by looking at the demand of energy and the forecast, and how do can we make an economic sense of where is the development and where will that technology be the best fit for? Thank you, Dr. Ambonif. Turning to our final panelist, Mr. Tolpa Goikjeli. How was that? Very good, thank you. Thank you, I, I was practicing. So you're an entrepreneur and are coming at innovation from, I guess, in contrast to the very high level multinational corporation that can benefit from economies of scale. You're seeing startups that are developing solutions that hopefully can scale. Could you give us some examples just from your experience in the startup sector of startups that are working in energy that have reached a point of successful sustainability and scalability? What are some of the lessons that we can learn from those kinds of organizations? Sure. Thank you very much for uh, the invitation, uh, Atlantic Council EBRD, and it's a real pleasure to be here on stage together with uh, the uh, bespoke individuals. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, as you've mentioned, uh, when you talk about startups, I know that it's a buzzword. A lot of people are talking about it now, um, but to what extent? To quote Reid Hoffman, who's the, the founder of, of LinkedIn, he famously said, an entrepreneur is somebody who, while jumping off the cliff, uh, is actually building a plane before he falls on the ground. Uh, now, that metaphoric and very extreme description actually, I think, points to one very uh, important point. Entrepreneurship is a mindset. It doesn't start with going and starting a company. Uh, you don't, in my view, don't become an entrepreneur just because you start a company. You're an entrepreneur because you, you have identified real problems and have a, an innovative solution driven by technology that actually solves that problem. And so when you talk about that mindset, we have seen that mindset disrupt a lot of industries uh, that have uh, traditionally been. Many of the leading players today have started off as a startup and have become uh, giant uh, companies. I personally do not think that uh, we should silo uh, startups, big companies, etc. I think that we should be working together and learning, seeing how we can learn from the entrepreneurial uh, view on the energy sector. Now, to give a few specific uh, uh, examples, the energy sector has traditionally not been the number one go-to area for startups. Why? Because it is a high capital intensive industry with wide-ranging, long, uh, long uh, time research-based uh, technological innovation, which obviously, as you have economies of scale, makes you much more competitive to, to thrive in. But with technological advancement, and we've done many studies on that field, we've seen the rise of the so-called new platform technologies, which start all the way from the manufacturing nanomaterials to the blockchain uh, decentralized applications, uh, or much, much more uh, in enhanced uh, computing powers that, that help with the magnitude of the data that's at stake here. So uh, in the energy field, we've started off from some of the, let's say, um, um, optimizing uh, parts, like, for example, when you talk about wind turbines, if you can reduce the frictions and therefore enhance the life cycle uh, of, your, uh, of your assets, that's already a good starting point, or increase the efficiency of the angle of your solar panels towards the sun uh, as the day advances, that's also an advantage. But what we're seeing now, and it was mentioned before, is we see increasingly computing technologies uh, help large-scale uh, en energy industry players basically um, stay up to date on the innovation front and also on the competitiveness front. And uh, here there are multiple uh, of examples. Uh, the blockchain industry was mentioned, but the blockchain industry is, is still quite in the, in, in the infancy. Why? Because a lot of the regulation is still not allowing, for example, in the state to, uh, for the prosumers that was mentioned by Owner Bay, that you basically are not allowed to, to sell the electricity that you would be as an individual producing. So there's a few um, uh, legislative uh, issues that are still uh, pending in most markets. But in the meantime, it was proven that the technologies can make significant impact. And so when you look at, at some of the examples, what are they? Um, when we look at, for example, uh, hardware versus software, uh, we see a lot of innovation uh, in the uh, battery storage field. So I myself have been working with kinetic energy storage uh, companies. We've seen large cost decreases on the battery scale. I think if you compare uh, the big numbers also from BNEF or the IEA, we've seen a reduction of about, uh, I think, battery storage in the last 10 years has now become one-eighth. Uh, you know about the tr uh, tremendous um, 
cost decreases in solar and wind, so that all makes it possible for entrepreneurs to step in and provide the industry with some more innovative approaches. Now, um, if, you, if you want me to talk about, about uh, specific examples, um, for example, uh, in Brooklyn, in the United States, in New York, uh, a company called LO3 has been at the forefront of using the blockchain in order to uh, connect the prosumers and they have basically uh, connected an existing microgrid, the Brooklyn microgrid, uh, which at the beginning was about 90 households, to uh, the blockchain and it enabled the, uh, the households to, to basically choose uh, the electron that they would be using uh, in case they needed it and also give them an opportunity to sell it in case they had a surplus. Now, the blockchain application may be uh, uh, scary for a lot of people, but I think what LO3 has been very good at doing is that they have removed some of the entry barrier fears of the utilities of using the data. How did they do it? By the encryption of the data, they basically allowed, think of it like um, you, have a, you have a wristband that allows you to participate in a conference like here or, or in, a, in an event. And as long as you uh, behave in the good sense of the term uh, by using the data, providing data or making more efficient uh, you know, modifications, you're allowed to using this data. But as soon as you breach it through the encryption mechanism, your access to that data will be cut. And that has uh, removed a lot of the fears from the utilities that we've seen now sharing more and more of the data because obviously the utilities have the unique access to the consumers. And so we've seen uh, Exergy, that's the name of their, uh, of their platform that's also tokenized and connected to smart metering, uh, thrive quite significantly. And we've been able to collect a lot of data of utilization, how people react once they're given the chance of, of trading the electricity. Um, there are many other uh, examples. Uh, LO3 got uh, an investment by Siemens, so it shows that there's also a, a competitive uh, advantage. And they've been doing pilot projects, uh, I think, from the US to Australia, Germany, and England. Um, that's just one example, but there are many multiple others, and I, I would invite you to have a look at basically how the blockchain enables you to address critical issues such as uh, grid security, connecting the microgrids to the existing grid in case there is a disruption, because energy security, maintenance of the grid, cost reduction of the transmission distribution systems, these are some of the biggest problems that, we need, that the industry is facing. Thank you, Timur. Um, there are a couple of things that you mentioned that I would like to come back to, but uh, first, to go to Mr. Ak, I know that you wanted to add something about blockchain, and then after that, I'd like to come to Ms. Akin Ozab to ask about how you take lessons from the startup scene into your business. So, uh, about the blockchain, uh, you know, uh, why we need it, or a similar system uh, for our life, you know. We, 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 to, when I started the business, you know, there was only 50 uh, companies that are dealing with the uh, energy production and distribution in Turkey. Today, uh, I think it's about 5,000 or 6,000, and it will reach to uh, more than a million, most probably in 10, day, 10, uh, 10 years' time. So everybody, uh, every household can be a producer of electric and also uh, a user. And at the same time, we, uh, electric cars, as I said, are coming, and they will be here and there in the grid, and everything, everybody can buy and sell electric from each other in a, uh, at a different time of the day. And uh, if the electric is cheap, I can store it. I can buy it for my cost, uh, you know, neighbor, and then I can sell it during the two hours later. To my, to my other, uh, you know, uh, neighbors, so, and and also uh, when you uh, today, uh, when again when I started, there were big power plants and they were producing and they were uh, distributing the electric, you know. And today, everywhere is producing the electric, and we need to shift it from here to there. It's like a uh, you know puzzle that somebody has to solve uh, in the future. So. Uh, if you want to do it on a fair basis, because you don't want your customers, people, to get offended as well, you know, I'm selling it for $2, he's buying for $3, you know, this, in order to uh, make all this uh, confusion go away, they say that, you know, the blockchain is the solution where it's a transparent system you can use to, you know, transfer, uh, you know, uh, electric from one customer to the other customer 
uh, on a fair price basis. So I don't know. This is uh, this is the uh, this is the future they say. But on the other side, uh, uh, there is one concern about blockchain. It consumes a lot of electric today uh, because of the uh, mining business. So uh, as of today, the total electric that is consumed by the blockchain system in the world is is similar to the consumption of Czech Republic. So uh, it's a lot of electric that is consumed. So somehow this electric consumption has to go down and there are some technologies coming like, you know, uh, they are working on that as well so that the uh, consumption of the electric goes down so that, you know, the system can be more sustainable uh, in the future for uh, you know, one example I would like to give today, if you want to transfer one Bitcoin, uh, it costs uh, 500 times more expensive, they say, huh? than uh, transferring by Visa card. So, uh, so it's very costly. Uh, so the electric, so that's why this Bitcoin price goes up and goes down, you know, uh, significantly. But we need to find that, they need to find a way, I don't know who, uh, but the smart guys, uh, so that this, uh, you know, this price uh, is stable and, uh, and it produces, it consumes less electric and, and helps the system to, you know, uh, run more smoothly in the future. So uh, this is something that I'm also uh, interested in. Uh, let's see what's going to happen next. <laughs> There's definitely some irony that so much electricity is consumed producing bitcoins, yes. especially a lot of it in China, where the grid is in many places certainly not very clean. Um, to come back also, to the also, uh, also most of the electric is produced in Russia by gas power plants, as far as I see for Bitcoin, you know. So, so tell us a little bit about from your exposure to, to the startups in the energy sector, how that informs your business strategy. The Bitcoin question, I feel like, can go on for quite a long time, but we're actually coming, unfortunately, to the end of the panel. So, a succinct answer. I think Timur has set up the scene quite well, and I'll continue from there, actually. Despite the challenges of the energy sector being the long-term, uh, long-time horizon characteristics and the large scale, startups have already taken a step towards finding a solution to all these problems. So I'm going to actually give some examples in Turkey of the startups and the issues that they're addressing. And the most important one, I would say, is the flexibility of production. So for a balanced distribution system between power plants and the renewables, business intelligence and smart platforms are used for balancing of the load and managing the flexibility. One of the startups, I'm sure there are many of them in Turkey, but I would say that we discuss amongst ourselves is Algopoly. Um, and Algopoly is, in that sense, offers predictive data for supply and demand management through analyzing production and consumption figures. Dream is another one, and there are others, um, but this is a field that most of them really uh, focus on. Another problem that they address is cost efficiency. Companies want to predict and calculate the optimum stock level from before to reduce costs and also use clever sensors in order to order spare parts and by using drones and robots for their maintenance. Dream again works specifically on that field to do demand side management, um, continuous energy performance monitoring and smart load manager. manager. Um, another area is electricity supply safety. Um, through IoT and data analytics combined together, it is easy to find the assets maintenance condition instantaneously and actually warn the personnel that is on the site for them to go and check out the anomalies that machine learning um, provides to them. As a fan, we use Solarian, you might have already heard of that startup, for our solar power plant control and project management and o and uh, Smart Pulse is another one, again. Uh, it monitors the facilities in real time 
and also from energy production to consumption through IoT infrastructure. Lastly, I would want to touch upon the consumer communication. Uh, for the com complaints or any kind of communication between uh, consumers, suppliers and um, the users, this is a platform for smart meters and smart payment solution that allows the customers to pay, pay in different mediums. Bloxy, I think you've already mentioned that, is a white label blockchain based solution that brings the seller, the producer and the supplier together. We as Akfan, we try to listen to all of them as much as we can and try to embed them in our um, company because we think s startups are the future. And so we try to uh, really monitor what's going on in the industry. Thank you. There are a couple of questions that I still want to ask the panel, but um, just to make sure that I leave time for the audience, is there anything that anyone would at this point like to ask? Oh, the floor is still mine. Okay. Oh, sorry. There's one in the corner. Is there a microphone that he could use? That might be faster. Thank you. Baris Tanlı from Minister of Energy of Republic of Turkey. I would like to ask a question to Turkish companies. Startups are very important for renewable energy and new generation energy technologies and innovation is very important for our ministry and for our republic. What kind of pledges do you have in your companies to support local startups? Sub, uh, what kind of pledges, promises do you have to support local startups in your companies? Do you want to go first? Or? Okay. Especially I mean, energy ones. <laughs> I mean, first of all, I think um, what we first do is to share ideas with each other. We try to understand them and how we can be useful to them. First, begin as a consumer, um, really try to understand what the dynamics of the startup is and how we can utilize it, utilize it even further. And if we can work together, and then we look at it in an investment perspective. Let me... Uh, Actually, uh, we have a company called uh, Vestal Ventures and also Zorla Ventures, uh, two companies. Uh, these are located both in Turkey and also in San Francisco. And uh, as of today, we are uh, meeting with every startup that is a, that is a, that are every startups that are able to reach us uh, throughout the last five years. You know and we will keep on meeting with them. We have invested uh, at least uh, two dozens of companies, as far as I know. And, uh, and also in the company we have, uh, we are, uh, we have an initiative, let's say, Parlak uh, Fikir, we call it, you know. Uh, and all the people in the company are having uh, uh, bringing their ideas to the bo uh, there is a board we have a board and at that board you know uh, people are bringing their ideas and we are uh, creating an environment where they can uh, compete and at the end we select a couple of them and we invest to their projects and this year we invested two projects within the group uh, and we gave them like five hundred thousand dollars each, and uh, they will be, you know, they, they also the people who bring the ideas also uh, give up their jobs. Now they are only focusing over there. If they cannot succeed, uh, they lose everything. So <laughs> they can uh, lose. Uh, so and people are, were, you know, the people were very happy to lose their job. You know, I didn't see. <laughs> Uh, happier <laughs> people, group of people than that. So uh, we are very into startups. Also, in Zorla Energy, we have we call it two startups. One is car sharing uh, business. Uh, now we are doing it within a couple of universities and also in in our building and in Zorla Center. You know, we have we bring electric cars. You can rent them through the uh, you know application uh, on a hourly. 
uh, or daily basis, and which and the car utilization is like 40 percent. Normally, the cars are used like 10 percent of the day. Uh, you know, you, people go to work, come back from work, and the car sits over there. But within with this system now, the cars are used for up to 40 percent, and also. Uh, you know, for char car char charging business, you know, right now it's number one in Turkey. Uh, it's the largest car charging station system. Uh, although we have only 1,000 cars, we have more than uh, 1,000 locations, let's say. <laughs> so, Thank you. I'll also give you a chance to speak, Mr. Jekyll. I don't think I'll be able to do as good as Sinambe, but <laughs> for, from our perspective in Cholik Energy, uh, we actually have an in-house incubator startup that we call IQB. And as we own all our own generating assets and distribution companies, there are three areas that this company is working on. One is, is the smart grid applications in our distribution networks. Uh, two, energy trading platforms and how we can develop them uh, for energy trading in the future. And, and finally, um, increasing the availability and efficiency of the existing assets that we have. So we're developing softwares. As we do so, uh, we're meeting with the um, existing uh, startups in Turkey, trying to collaborate with them and trying to, trying to develop these solutions and commercialize them. Thank you. I'd also like to turn a version of that question to Dr. Almonif, actually. Digitalization, um, as we've heard already, offers such a huge variety of new ideas and ways to optimize the performance of assets. Does GE Renewables try and develop those kinds of solutions internally, or do you look at what's going on in the startup landscape as well and to try and either get into dialogue with startups and perhaps acquire them into your business model, or do you work on developing that kind of know-how in-house? So we have, uh, we've developed a lot of those ideas internally because we've, uh, we have a big business within the digital industry just to focus on asset performance management. How can we prefer, uh, optimize the performance of our turbine? And not only that, but also how can we predict exactly if there is anything that's going to go wrong? We are in touch exactly with what's going on in the industry. So definitely sharing best practices. If there is any new ideas coming from startups, how can we adapt and how can we learn in developing it? The most important thing for us is to develop reliable energy output to our customers with uh, most efficient data, reliability, running the asset efficiently, as well as predictability if there is any problems, how can we predict it and how can we actually fix it ahead of time. In addition, because we're investing a lot in new technologies, these new technologies we need to understand exactly how are they going to be functioning and what is the predictability. We're implementing a new method which is called the digital twin to understand exactly when you have a new technology, how can you run it you know, digitally to understand exactly what is the performance, uh, where, what are the areas that is, uh, you need to watch out for, the areas that you need to improve to actually be able to predict. But digital is the way to go, specifically when you're focusing on service and not only focusing on what you have, but being in touch with the industry and best practice sharing as well. Thank you. And we don't have much time left, but I don't want to close out this discussion without talking about storage. Um, as has rightly been pointed out, the, the cost declines in storage have been incredible. I mean, even just since 2018, uh, BNF sees the prices of lithium ion batteries coming down, I think 13%. Um, and that's, you know, not to mention what has happened in, in the years before where the curve basically looks like that. I wanted to ask, actually, Mr. Ujikal, and if anyone, in fact, wants to jump in on this, how do you think nuke technologies can gain ground in market systems that are not necessarily fully liberalized? And how, where do the investment signals come from? In, in places like the UK, where there is a robust ancillary services market, uh, batteries and demand response can participate um, in capacity auctions. What will the future be in this region? And how will storage and other uh, innovative solutions, such as demand response, manage to enter the market? I think, as you said, in UK, there is also already an ancillary services market uh, that's auctioned. Uh, similar, I think, in the US, in California, and also in Northeast, they have uh, ancillary services auctions that, that's going on. I think in, in our region, in our markets, um, as we heard from the energy ministers today in the morning, there is uh, going to be a liberalization and regulation that will come quickly to be able to govern the battery storage applications. Um, I think what's key is um, I, I see two points, uh, government-private sector partnership 
and understanding each other is key to accelerate the investment and the adaptation of these new technologies in this area. And the second is, as you mentioned, the price. I mean, as the economic feasibility of these applications uh, is increasing quickly, I think there's going to be a huge demand to be able to apply these technologies in, in the region that we operate. Thank you. Is there anything else the, the panel wants to add on the applicability of storage? Yes, please, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I'd like to add a, a few points on, 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 the, on the issues mentioned. So, first Briefly, of all... Briefly, if possible, because we're running yeah, out of time. Um, in Turkey, actually, contrary to maybe what, what mainstream is, is observing, there's a lot of very positive signals that are being made at all levels. I mean, on the one hand, you have uh, companies from the private sector that are increasingly looking at, uh, at startups in the, you know, in, in an actual, uh, you know, they've invested in it, they've worked with them, and they've made partnerships with them, but also on the public sector. Um, this year, we've done an incredible workshop with, together with the minister, actually, on 24th of April in Ankara at the ministry itself, where we discussed only entrepreneurship and startups in the energy sector, both the startup and scale-up. And all of the um, startups that you had mentioned as well, so Lauren Bloxy, uh, they were present there, and the minister had actually then, they have issued uh, a statement where they encouraged the private sector to engage uh, more with the startups in Turkey. And I think that this is a precedent in, in an emerging market context and especially important for, uh, for the region itself. Um, on, on storage, like in other technologies, I think the public-private partnerships apply to those areas where it's large-scale, high cost, and also maybe longer term in order to decrease these, these time, time schedules. And last but not least, on the, on the, um, on the blockchain, uh, I think we need to, I totally agree, unfortunately, it's very energy uh, inefficient, but that mainly applies to what happened with the Bitcoin. Uh, blockchain is the underlying technology, and there have been many, many more um, uh, efficient ways to, to address the energy uh, inefficiency of that, of that particular matter. But I think we should distinguish the, the blockchain uh, from the Bitcoin application. Thank you. The blockchain. I think so one of the ideas you can start thinking of developing blockchain computing facility through renewable and in some and selecting location where you have fantastic resources that will help you to drive the cost down. And we're seeing a lot of big companies in the West moving to this part of the region to actually deploy it because you have remarkable resources and you can drive the cost of electricity significantly down. As for the new sources of trends and storage, I think so storage is a good idea. But you can start up gradually. There are new business models that's going to help you to drive the cost even significantly lower. Start with hybrid. How can you use multiple sources of renewable energy to increase your capacity into reaching into a base load? And then add storage for the remaining part that's needed, specifically with the current cost of storage today that is so high. So there are solutions to start up, but I think so storage is going to be an integral part, but you need to reduce the cost of that today before you reach to a full uh, implementation. Thank you. Good points. I, we've really gone, I think, on a whirlwind trip around anything that falls under innovation in the energy sector, but we managed to drop a lot of buzzwords while also adding, I think, really meaningful um, and interesting conversation. To conclude, I want to give my panelists actually the chance to say the last word, but actually basically in single words. So I'd like to ask each of you to tell us max in five words what technology or software or hardware innovation or solution you are most excited about just looking towards the next decade? <laughs> we were actively working on um, hybrid That's generation too many words. applications. Hybrid, <laughs> hybrid generation. <Thanks. laughs> I, uh, you know, uh, yeah, it's a smart grid, I guess. Yeah, smart <laughs> grid is the, and blockchain, I guess, can be very interesting. Build base load grid electrons. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, definitely smarter. Electric mobility on the ground and in the air. Uh, autonomous and modular. And also uh, the human collaboration. That was a lot, but a, we a need nice the last summary. One. Thank you. Um, thank you for your kind attention. Um, I'd like to thank the panelists, but before I do that, just introduce uh, the next session, our last one for the day. Her Excellency Minister Belinda Baluko is here from Albania, and uh, Ambassador Matt, um, what was your last name, Briza, will be here to host a one-on-one -on -one conversation with her. Thank you. <laughs>